ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Deputy Group CEO for Technology and Digital Air Asia, Irene Omar, in discussion with editor, Skift Airline Weekly, Madhu Unikrishnan. Yes. <laughs> Good afternoon. Welcome back from coffee break. I hope everyone's properly caffeinated. I want to thank you, Irene Omar, for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, pleasure. Um, for taking the time. So uh, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions about uh, technology and the future and how AirAsia is transforming itself with, through the use of technology. So to that end, um, an AirAsia executive recently said that AirAsia, and I quote, aspires to be the Amazon of travel. That's a really ambitious goal. Can you walk us Walk us through that. <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure. Um, ambitious, um, but I think it's very doable. Um, of course, we need to have a good set of people to be able to materialize that. So why we think we can be the Amazon of travel, really, it's because of the fact that we have so much data um, in our operations. We have lots of data coming from our booking system, data coming from our aircraft and engine, and data coming from the terminal uh, with the passenger movement and so forth. And 80% of our bookings are actually through our website and also our mobile app. And that's like a, a huge number of data that we can understand from our passengers and, and so forth. So um, just over two years ago, we started on this digital journey. We decided to ingest all the data coming from various systems um, and we put them into cloud. And that's the foundry. And by end of this year, all of our systems would be, all our data would be in cloud. There wouldn't be any on-premise um, um, at all, really. So we feel that this is something that needs to be done. Uh, we feel there's a lot of data that we need to put them in one foundry so we can visualize it better. And we find that with the data and becoming more of a data-driven company, um, we be able to increase um, our revenues better, find ways of improving the revenue base, the conversion rate, uh, find more optimization and personalization and so forth. Um, also improving in relation to our productivity and efficiency in terms of uh, costs um, and so forth. How can we do more predictive maintenance and so forth. And with the data that we have, how do we provide a seamless journey for our passengers from the moment they book until they return from their flight? And we also saw an opportunity to build new business areas um, that will complement um, the core business, which is flying people around, and also our ancillary business. And we saw that that new business areas also will fill in all the consumer needs and wants in terms of giving them a pleasant journey throughout um, uh, uh, experiencing with air Asia or wherever they're they're flying to and the destination they're flying to, they have a pleasant time, really. Well, that that's a really good. Uh, that leads to a question I wanted to ask you. You know, um, another um, airline CIO recently said or said at a Skift conference actually that there's a um, there's a fine line between using data in a caring way and a creepy way. Right. In other words, you know, wishing, <laughs> wishing a passenger a happy birthday when they get on board is, is great, but, but telling a passenger, oh, I'm sorry your dog died is, <laughs> is awful, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Um, how do you navigate those waters? How do you see that um, going forward? Yeah, I, I, I suppose the, the whole idea is to basically improve the whole experience for them as opposed to freaking them out. That's not... Uh, the idea um, that why we want to have more personalization is also to be more targeted in, t in terms of their needs and their wants, as opposed to generalizing um, a marketing campaign into one size fits all, because that doesn't work. You know, that will annoy your own passengers more than anything else. You would prefer to fly with an airline that knows your needs and your wants that understand um, what you hope to do when you get to a certain destination, that understands what kind of experience that you want to have when you fly to Bali, for instance, or the kind of people, like-minded people that you can meet uh, when you go scuba diving in Bali, for instance, or surfing and so forth. So these are areas where we want to be able to, uh, to, 
to enhance um, that experience in, in terms of that travel journey. And this can be brought into your day-to-day -day lifestyle as well. So hence the reason why we felt there's a lot more that we can do uh, as opposed to just flying people around. We have so much data. I mean, we, we, this year itself, we're looking at carrying about close to 100 million passengers um, this year in Southeast Asia itself. And we have over 330 routes. Our brand is um, very well known in Asia and also in other parts of the world as well. Um, and we have huge number of visitors coming to our website, about 60 million a month, and half of them are unique. So it feels that data has become a key asset for us. It's no longer the aircraft, but the data. And there's a lot of new business opportunities that we can build around it. And um, so we want to work that assets more. What else can we be apart from just selling flights? And hence, the reason why we're evolving into a more than just an airline, we're selling other things like travel itineraries, hotels, trip building, shopping, wellness, and so forth, basically. Well, that, that, that's actually very interesting. I mean, so I, I, you just said it, but also um, Tony Fernandez has said that there, the aim is ultimately to sell everything on AirAsia.com, including tickets on other airlines. Yes. So yeah. how did the other airlines feel about that? Do they I, know this is happening? <laughs> um, I think most, some of them do, and I think um, most are not afraid to do so because I think it's an opp opportunity for them to have access to um, the network that we have, uh, to the data that we have and so forth in relation for them to be able to um, sell more tickets and, and, and all that. And, and I think it's, it will be quite exciting. Um, and I think we have already started, um, but soon we'll be getting more um, airlines to be able to sell their tickets on our website. Do you know how the online travel agencies feel about it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think they're a bit cautious and they're monitoring what we're doing. And, um, but I think also it's a way of embracing as well. If they have itineraries that they want to sell, why not? You know, we have that big platform. Mm -hmm. Just um, link it up with us. Yep. One thing that I was very interested to hear, is, and that is pretty um, unusual, is that you have a plan to sell um, belly hold cargo space. Yeah. Both to consumers and to businesses, is that correct? Yes, that's right. So that company is called Teleport. It actually started with our cargo operations. And how we started with our cargo operations, because we have huge network. Like I mentioned, over 330 routes. We have a lot of frequencies in some of the key routes in this region and so forth. Um, and, and we have over close to 300 planes, a lot of belly space there. Um, and we felt that, you know, how can we optimize the revenue during that turnaround time? And this is where we thought that, okay, we can put cargo in there. And, um, and we saw that business grew, and this is mostly B2B businesses. And we thought that if we can take this further and manage the belly space of other airlines as well, and also to look into um, B2C, um, since you see a lot of e-commerce growth in this part of this region, and they do need um, goods to be transport into various destinations where, um, where we have that, that destination and, and that particular route and the frequency, the breadth and the depth of the network actually uh, complements some of the e-commerce um, companies and so forth. And this is where we thought that this is a good business to build, the whole logistic business, not just the cargo, but also the courier part of it, the last mile, the first mile and so forth. And we have built an ecosystem in the sense that it's not just planes, but travel, hotels, itineraries, um, our fintech company called Big Pay, um, and also um, Teleport, uh, which is our logistic business. So it's a whole ecosystem that uh, we have created, and I think we can leverage on each other uh, very well and you know, cross-sell ac uh, across different platforms in airasia.com, in, in our loyalty platform, in our fintech platform, and also in Red Cargo or Teleport, which we just renamed. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Um, so can we zero in on the fintech part of it for yeah. a minute? Um, how, are you, how is this being adapted for cryptocurrencies or currencies of the future? Do, they, do you accept them now or will 
you know, money will change. No, we, we try, no, we, we're, I don't think we're brave enough to use cryptocurrency <laughs> at this point in time because the value fluctuates so much and there isn't any real use cases. At the end of the day, we need to instill confidence um, with our consumer and passengers um, that, you know, they can use this currency and it won't fluctuate the next minute and so forth. Um, what we are looking at is in terms of like how can we build more frequency of our loyalty points because that's a form of tokenization as well. That's, the f that's an alternate to a currency. How can we increase more frequency of that use rather than just redeem on flights? Because generally, in this part of the world, people just fly on average um, four times a year maybe. That's not enough frequency. So how can we use these points for other things, to buy hotels, to buy itinerary, to buy food? Um, and how do we earn more points? How do we create that velocity? And I think when you have built many use cases of these loyalty points, it essentially become a currency in itself. Oh. And when you have more usage, then it will be a good basis to build a cryptocurrency. Great. And just as a reminder, if you want to ask questions, please do so on the app or at slido.com, hashtag, um, hashtag something. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot what it is. <laughs> um, all right. If we can, uh, <laughs> excuse me. Well, this would be a good point to talk um, also about um, sort of how you approach, um, how you sell tickets in such a vast geographically, geographical area that's one that's very culturally and linguistically diverse, but also economically diverse. And I just wanted to ask you a question on how do you reach the underbanked and the unbanked right. and how you sell tickets and, and, other, and now other products? Right. Yeah. So um, the payment gateway and so forth is always something that is quite essential and important in our business operations, especially when we're um, doing our bookings and online and so forth. And especially, we are quite known to open up new destinations and it's not just uh, the first tier or the second tier. We're looking at third tier cities as well and sometimes we're connecting third tier cities with third tier cities and we're looking at the whole ASEAN region as our backyard, really. And, um, and, and if you look at the 10 countries in Southeast Asia, majority of those um, are either under bank or unbank. Um, only Malaysia, Singapore, or Thailand have got high rates of percentage of um, the population, which is bank, basically. So how do we reach out to those? Because they do have cash, right? Um, and I mean, traditionally, when we when we first started, it's um, to reach out to the unbanked is really go to the travel agency or to our kiosk and so forth where they can pay in cash and all that. But now you have a lot of e-wallet um, in this region, uh, such as Momo in Vietnam, you have Alipay, WeChat Pay, uh, you have uh, Doku Wallet in Indonesia or Ovo and so forth. So it's actually um, growing quite fast and rapidly, and, and these are areas where we need to work with them in order to be able to reach to the uh, unbank, uh, basically. Yeah. So you're giving them other payment options? Besides, yes. Right? Yeah. But for, for customers that want to use cash, yeah. uh, do they have that option as well? To um, well, if they, if they have a bank account, yes, they could mm -hmm. directly from their they can transfer money directly from their bank account. Uh, they can use big pay um, as well. But um, yes, they can still use cash, but we're trying to limit, we're trying to reduce that and to encourage people to either, um, you know, uh, pay through some form of a e-money or through big pay um, and so forth, basically. So let's pause on big pay for a second. Sure. Can you explain exactly what that is? Well, it's, it's really a um, digital bank that we're trying to create. So it has e-money wallet license in Malaysia as well as um, foreign exchange and remittances. Um, and eventually it will be able to lend money as well. Hmm. Um, so it's spending um, around the region um, in Singapore, in Thailand, Indonesia, and Philippines will be the key areas. Um, so it's um, so so basically it, it evolves into around three key areas that I just mentioned, um, which is the peer-to-peer e-money -peer e wallet, the foreign exchange and remittances, and also the lending part. So that's the 
core area that we're starting in terms of getting those licenses. We have them already in Malaysia. So eventually, people will be able to um, purchase, um, I mean, buy flights or holidays, and they'll be able to pay in installment, which is cheaper than any credit card rates and so forth, and we'll be able to reach out to bigger audiences. Because we see payment is, has become a form of a, a lifestyle as well. Um, so it's... Um, it's important to be able to have that ease of use um, to pay, uh, a better user experience and so forth. And this is where we think big pay could come in because we th it all started where we saw our own passengers lining up uh, in, in the airport trying to, you know, to change their money mm -hmm. and the banks are charging them with huge margin and we thought that this is not quite right. I mean, they should be able to enjoy their... Um, holidays and so forth, and that's a better way of doing this, and that's the birth of big pay, really. Interesting. Well, I have one, one kind of uh, com completely off-topic question, um, sort of a human interest question. Um, there are not a lot of women um, at your position in this industry. Um, what does this, the travel industry writ large, what does the travel industry need to do to attract more women, um, especially in Asia? I think um, it should really begin, if you see travel industries, there's a lot of women in, in the travel uh, uh, industry in terms of building holidays and itineraries and so forth and, and all that. But I think the most important thing would be to build up that presence of uh, more women in aviation. That's, that's um, the start that we need to do because if you look at most airlines when we first started, there's hardly any women pilot. And, and that's really, shouldn't be that way, really. Um, so we need to make sure that we have more women become pilots. And that's what we did when we first started our cadet program. We, we thought that we open up to women and encourage girls after school or universities to apply for, uh, to become pilots. We open up engineering as well for, pi um, for women to to apply, and we have um, about 6% of uh, engineers in, in our company of, uh, of women as well. And we have quite a high number of women pilots too, uh, almost 10% of our pilots are women. So I think that is really important to, to really, if you want to get more women to be in this industry, the first thing to do is like open up all those areas that was usually dominated by men to allow women to be able to have that um, opportunity as well. And we have to be able to open up to schools as well and have the girls inspired by becoming a pilot rather than just flight attendant or engineers or now as data scientists or uh, software developers and so forth. And that's something that we really need more women in as well. Great, well, thank you. Let's, take, let's go to the audience for a few questions. Um, this comes from... Let's go with Anonymous. Air Asia talks of wanting to build up a whole travel ecosystem. Which other gaps does the airline, our airline want to cover? Tours and activities? Um, that's, well, tours and activities, that's something that we're, we're already selling at airasia.com, and that's something that we want to improve and enhance and so forth. I think it's a whole travel ecosystem that we're looking at. It's, it's uh, not just in relation to hotels or travel itineraries. Um, and so forth um, in relation to logistic, which is also important. Retail is also important um, because it's all part of lifestyle, basically. Mm -hmm. And travel is a form of lifestyle, too. So there's so many areas, even supply chain, even fintech, um, and areas where they call it digital enablers. Um, uh, these are areas such as the IoTs, the uh, uh, mach um, machine learning, big data, cybersecurity, voice uh, recognition and facial recognition as well. This can actually elevate the sectors such as uh, travel and lifestyle and fintech into a whole new different level. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, we're, we're very keen to look at all this things and then many room for improvement to build that whole eco lifestyle ecosystem. Great. Yeah. Um, there's, uh, let's go with this other anonymous question. Um, what kind of data about customers that Air does AirAsia have that is superior t to the, those of the OTAs and how do, these how do these data help 
AirAsia become the Amazon of travel? <laughs> yeah. So, um, well, as we those we understand uh, their preference in terms of travel, where they like to travel. Uh, how long they spend in their travel and who they travel with, basically, whether it's a group or individual and so forth. And, um, and based on um, uh, the itinerary or the hotels that they, um, that they purchase, we can understand what they are, um, what their preference are and, 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 and all that. Um, and when we add in more use cases to use the loyalty points, and this is where we're able to see what they like to do on a day-to-day -day basis and whether that day-to-day -day lifestyle can be brought into jet travel um, or so. So, for instance, if someone, we you know someone likes to do yoga for three times a week in Malaysia, and if that person flies to Bali, we could recommend some good yoga places for them. Oh, interesting. Um, let's go with uh, this question from Gleb. Air Asia actively invests in travel startups through a dedicated fund. What's the rationale behind that, and what is Air Asia contributing to targets beyond capital? Yeah, all this started as we evolved into a travel and lifestyle tech. So it all started with our digital journey, where we saw what beauty data can be and how we feel that we need to digitalize the whole corporation to be more, um, uh, more more automated and, and how we can use machine learning and so forth. So in that journey or in that process where we're trying to understand how to improve uh, the whole operations, we saw we know what our pain points are. And, and we needed to find ways on how to address those pain points. Um, and when we have identified that, then we look at the tech solution that our own tech team will be able to provide. And if we can't find that solution, then we look at outside to see if our key business partners will be able to help co-develop things with us to address the pain points. Um, and so, so we actually do embrace open innovation and we practice open innovation, where ideas not just only come from within the company, but we embrace ideas coming from our business partners and, for, and also other vendors or other startups. Um, and when we saw a startup that would be able to provide a solution to our problems and this address the industry's problem, then we feel this is a good idea for us to invest and actually be part of that value creation because the solution is not only just providing Air Asia but also other industry players and potentially other, play, other verticals as well. Um, so why not? invest in them. And as we do that, then we saw the opportunity that um, we should create a fund. Um, and this is called Rate Beat Capital. And, we sh and there are many LPs out there who, had, who shares the same vision as us. And they're also interested to see if they can be part of it because they see how successful we are as an airline, as a low-cost carrier first, and how we evolve into something else. Um, and they have seen the successes that we have over the years that we started as, an, um, as AirAsia. So for them, there's an opportunity for any startups around the world to have access to our network, to be able to test things with us, um, and to be able to deploy that solution to other um, players in the market and maybe other industries. Great. Well, I want to thank you very much for, for joining us today in Singapore. And it was a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.